of the same bone. Okay, so we have this bone and that bone which are fused right in the center. All right, so we are saying that this portion is called the maxilla. The two make up the maxillae because they are two, right? Yes. So this is a bone that actually supports, if you look at it, it is the bone that makes up the upper jaw. The upper jaw. And when we look at the upper jaw, it is well known for the fact that the teeth of the upper jaw are lodged in it, okay? And that portion of this bone where the teeth are lodged is known as the alveolar process. The alveolar process. That you must know at least, okay? What else do we need to know about the maxilla, okay? So when you look at the maxillary bone, you find that it also contributes to the formation of the roof of the oral cavity. When you lift your tongue, that tongue, will be, its movements will be limited by the roof of the oral cavity, which we call the palate. So one of the major bones that contributes to the formation of the palate is the maxillary bone. Is that clear? Is that clear? And this palate separates the oral cavity, which is the mouth, from the nasal cavity. All right, so I need you to take note of bones that separate cavities. Last time we talked about the frontal bone, which was separating the cranial cavity from the orbit. And then we went on and mentioned that the ethmoid bone separates the cranial cavity from the nasal cavity. And now we are saying that the maxilla is actually one of the contributing bones in the separation of the oral cavity from the, uh, 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 the nasal cavity. So that is the maxilla, which is this bone we are seeing here. The next facial bones that we're going to talk about are the zygomatic bones the zygomatic bones, commonly referred to as the cheekbones. So when you look at a diagram like this one, our zygomatic bone is this one here. Okay, that's the zygomatic bone, and it is paired also. There's one on the right, one on the left. And we are seeing that this same zygomatic bone Anterior medially, it is actually articulating with the maxilla, okay? And superiorly, it is articulating with the frontal bone, all right? And also posteriorly, it is articulating with the temporal bone, forming this arch there. The temporal, zygomatical temporal arch, okay? So we find it at just at this point, just here. So we are saying that that particular portion of a bone that we are able to palpate is formed by the union of the zygomatic bone and the temporal bone. So that is what I'm talking about. So I have the zygomatic bone there, which is articulating with which is articulating with the temporal bone there to form the zygomatical temporal arch. We will learn about all these as we go on. Clear? Yes, ma'am. The next facial bone that I'm going to talk about is the lacrimal bone. The lacrimal bone. Now, again, the lacrimal bone is actually a paired bone. Very special bone because this is a piece of bone that we find in the palate. And this same bone extends as far as the orbit. Now let's see if we'll be able to, to trace some of the parts of the uh, palatine bone. This is the inferior view of the skull. And I want to draw your attention to the roof of the oral 
it. Can you see it? Can you see it? What have we removed here? We've removed the lower jaw, right? We have put it aside. And then we are now looking at the roof of the oral cavity, which is making up, or which is made up of the palate. Now, this palate, you will realize that it is divided into two. The anterior part, which is supported by bone, is known as the hard palate. The posterior part of the roof of your oral cavity is soft. And so we call it the soft palate. The anterior part, if you try to lift your tongue, you will be able to feel that the anterior part of the roof of your tongue is hard. That is the hard palate. Why is it hard? It's because it is supported by bone. And so we are saying that the bones that are supporting that hard palate are these ones here. I'm sure we can see the purple bone there which is actually the maxilla itself. Remember we said that it contributes to the formation of the palate, right? Posterior to the, the, the maxilla is this bone, which we are calling the palatine bone. Okay. Which bones were, was, was I talking about? Which bone was I talking about? La crema. I think I went and started talking about the palatine bone. Okay, let's, 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 just cancel a cream bone and write palatine bone. When you had written the cream say palatine bone. Mm -hmm. I hope I haven't lost you. Replace the word cream with palatine. Clear? And so I am now talking about the palatine bone, right? So here is my palatine bone. This palatine bone is actually L shaped. It's a paired bone, there's one on the right, one on the left, right? It's L-shaped, and I want you to look at this. So I'm saying that it is L-shaped. It has this horizontal plate, and it has a perpendicular plate. Is that clear? Horizontal plate and perpendicular plate. So what we are seeing here, on the roof of the oral cavity is the, uh, the horizontal plate. Can you see? And we are seeing two bones here. The horizontal plate of this left bone, I hope this is the left side, and this other right side. Okay, so there's this palatine bone and this palatine bone. And their perpendicular plates are meeting in the midline. Are you oriented? The horizontal plates are meeting in the midline. So this is what we are seeing. The horizontal plate of this palatine bone and this horizontal plate of the other palatine bones and they are meeting in the midline. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Now, the perpendicular plate on the other hand actually extends as far as the orbit. Are you getting me? So I'm going to show you uh, uh, the orbit. I want us to look at the orbit because I said that the perpendicular plate goes as far as the orbit. Okay, not so nice. All right, I know that this wasn't nice, the color coded, it was left out, but it's a piece of a bone that you're going to find almost right at that end, okay? So you find that perpendicular plate, which is coming from or connected to the horizontal plate that we found on the roof of the oral cavity, goes upwards to go and extend and terminate in the orbit. One bone is found, the same bone is found in the oral cavity and the same bone is found where? In the orbit. Is that clear? Yes. 
the next facial bonds that I'm going to talk about are the lacrimal bonds. So when we talk about the lacrimal bonds, what does the term lacrimation mean? Lacrimation means tearing, okay? Like when, when you are crying, huh? the tears are flowing down, right? So we are now saying that these special bonds are found in the orbits and they are related to the system of the body that handles tears, draining of tears. We will look at this one day when we do head and neck. So because it is related to the system of the body, the lacrimal system of the body, we are also calling it the lacrimal bone. Here, the lacrimal bone has been given a purple color. Can you see? And it is also a paired bone. It's a very thin plate of bone. And you will see that this, these same bones, the lacrimal bones, together with the other bones that we are seeing on the medial wall of the orbit, the orbit also can be given or can be looked at as a room like this one. It has a roof, it has the lateral walls of the posterior wall. Is that clear? So one lateral wall and one medial wall. And so this is the medial wall of the orbit. So the lacrimal bone is also contributing to the formation of the medial wall of the orbit. Separating, get me right, contributing to the separation of the wall that separates the nasal cavity from the orbit. Clear? People just look. <laughs> Where is the problem? I'm simply saying that the medial wall to which the lacrimal bone also belongs, right? Medial wall of the orbit, right? Imagine when you remove your eye. We are looking at that space, that socket, which we are calling the orbit. And we are saying that this orbit has walls. It has a roof, right? It has a lateral wall, and it has a medial wall. Clear? And I'm now saying that among the bones that contribute to the formation of the medial wall is the lacrimal bone. Clear? Yes. And the medial wall separates the orbit from the nasal cavity. Therefore, if you fracture the middle, medial wall, what will happen? There will be a communication between the orbit and the what? The nasal cavity. That is how I want you to be thinking. I just don't want you to memorize those uh, uh, pieces of bones that have been nicely color-coded. In real life, they don't have those colors. We have nicely color-coded them so that you can follow them. Is that clear? Good. The next piece of bone, or the next facial bones that I'm going to talk about are the Inferior nasal conche or conche. My professor used to call them conche. Okay? Inferior nasal conche. Okay? One is called a concha or concha, depending on who taught you. Right? And several are called conche. Is that clear? Inferior, meaning they are located down, right? Nasal, what does that tell us? The nasal cavity, right? Conque. A conque is a, a conca is a shelf-like structure. Is that clear? Now, these, these are, this is the, oh, they are paired bones. There's one on the right, one on the left. In other words, what? On the uh, 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 right nasal cavity, the other one is on the left nasal cavity. Now I need you to appreciate what is happening here. This is a sagittal section of the skull. Are you oriented? Yes. 
I want to draw your attention to this portion of the skull. We are actually in the left nasal cavity. And to be specific, we are actually looking at the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. What am I talking about? I'm simply saying that, let's look at this thing. This is the nasal cavity. Oriented, this is the anterior view, right? And this is the nasal cavity, right? And we are now saying that this nasal cavity is actually divided by a nasal septum into two cavities, right? Yes. That's, that's what we said yesterday, right? Yes, right. And so, there's this nasal cavity and this nasal cavity. Each nasal cavity, take it as though it was a room as well. It has a roof, it has a lateral wall, it has a medial wall. What do you think is making up the medial wall? What do you think is making up the medial wall? Yes, sir. The septum. I only the way to septum. Okay? I want you to be oriented. I'm saying that each nasal cavity, how many nasal cavities do we have? Two, which are separated by what? A septum and nasal septum. And I'm saying that each nasal cavity, <coughs> take it as though well, it's a room as well, which has a roof, a lateral wall, a medial wall, which is made up of the nasal septum, and the floor. Oriented? Yes. Oriented? Yes. Okay. So this is what I'm talking about. <coughs> There's a roof of the nasal cavity. There's a lateral wall. This is a, I mean, sorry. This is a lateral wall. And medially, we are saying that there's a nasal septum. And there's a flow of the nasal cavity. Oriented? Now, I want to draw your attention to the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. The lateral wall. Which is this one that we are looking at? This is the lateral wall. Okay? And already from this lateral wall, we are seeing shelf-like structures. That one there, that one there, and that one there. There are three. Have you seen the three shelf-like structures we're talking about? Yes, yes. yes and those shelf-like structures are called concave. Clear? Yes. So there's a superior concave. What is called a concave? There's a superior concave. Middle conquer and the now get me right. The superior conquer, which is that one there, let me show you. The superior conquer, that one there, and the middle conquer, they are part of the ethmoid bone. Clear? Then the inferior conquer is an independent bone. And that is the bone we are trying to talk about. Is that all right? And there are two. How are you? I'm all right, thanks. Welcome. Good. I love you all. Don't worry. I just singled out a second face. Okay. So have you followed me so far? Have you followed me so far? Yes. Did I mention yesterday that the ethmoid bone also has air cells? Mm -hmm. Okay, now document something. I just remember. So that's our ethmoid bone I showed you yesterday, which had a crystal gallery, the cripriform plate separating the cranial cavity from the nasal cavity. Now, in the nasal cavity, we can see some concave, so the medial concave. And by the way, this concave increase in size as you go down. So the superior nasal conca is smaller than the middle conca, which is also smaller than the what? Inferior nasal conca. So the inferior nasal conca is a separate bone from the ethmoid bone. And pair, there's one on the right, one on the left. So those were the inferior nasal conca. Conca, because there are many now. All right? <coughs> The next bone, facial 
initial bond that we are going to talk about is the boma. It's a single bond. The boma. The boma is a very simple bond. It contributes to the formation of the nasal septum. This is the sagittal section. I'll be repeating, I'll be emphasizing because I don't want you to be lost. So I need you to be oriented. So I'm now saying that this is the sagittal section of the skull. Are we together? And I want to draw your attention right at this point. And where we are, just here, we are actually on the nasal septum. What you are seeing here is the nasal septum. And I say that the nasal septum, somebody asked yesterday, she says, the nasal septum, oh, bony, or there are some other uh, tissues in there. So I say that the nasal septum has a superior and posterior part which is bony, while as the anterior part is all cartilaginous. Is that clear? So, the bony part of the nasal septum is made up mainly of the ethmoid bone. Remember, it had that perpendicular process, right? So, this is that perpendicular process of the ethmoid bone that is contributing to the formation of the bony septum. It is actually attached inferiorly to the bone that we are looking at, which is this one, the vulva. Can you see that? Is it, what color is that? What color is this? Pink. Eh? Okay, I need to go back to nursery school. I thought pink was something like this one. It's a different shade of pink. Eh? Okay, then I'm correct. I didn't know this was pink. But nevertheless, this bone that you are seeing here, articulating superiorly with the perpendicular process of the ethmoid bone. So the ethmoid bone actually looks a bit unique. Eh? So far we've met it. Making up contributing to the formation of the nasal septum. We are also seeing it contributing to the formation of the lateral walls of the nasal cavity, right? Now, now that we now have an idea, I'll go back to this end point bone. With its perpendicular plate forming the nasal septum, <coughs> These conquer the middle and the superior conquer, middle and the superior conquer, they are all contributing to the formation of the lateral walls of the nasal cavity. So we have this nasal cavity and this nasal cavity separated by the septum. And yet this same bone con uh, contributes the formation of the lateral walls and the nasal septum. At the same time, it is separating the nasal cavity from the cranial cavity above. Have you pictured right in your brains how this ethmoid bone is? Have you? Okay. okay. Try and get it here and identify it there. Have you seen it there? Yes. Are you seeing what is happening there? It's there in the nasal cavity. You will find it in the cranial cavity. It's also contributing to the separation already just from here. You are seeing that it is also contributing to the separation of the orbit from the nasal cavity. Is that what you are seeing? Yes. Meaning it is also contributing to the medial wall of the orbit. So it is centrally placed there. Okay, behind the maxilla or the maxillae, right and left, <coughs> you will find this. Clear? Yeah. Yeah. That is the ethmoid bone. But we were not talking about the ethmoid bone. I brought out the ethmoid bone after trying to explain what the inferior nasal culture is. 
You can't just talk about the inferior nasal culture. You must also talk about the middle and the superior culture, okay, for you to be able to understand. So that was the inferior nasal culture. All right. So I'm done with the cranial bones. Which of the cranial bones is single? I, I saw you not cranial bones, facial bones. Which of facial bones that we just we are just from talking about is single? Huh? Yes, ma'am. The bone, right? And the rest of the bones are pair. I'll just go through the list again <coughs> of these crane uh, facial bones. We talked about the nasal bones. We talked about the maxillae. One is called the maxilla. We talked about the zygomatic bones. Thank you so much. Which other bones? The palatine, the lacrimal bones. And then which other bones? The inferior nasal concave. Are we together? Yes. All right. Any questions on the facial bone? Nasal, maxilla, zygomatic. That's very cheeky, right? Zygomatic. So a palatine up there, right? The maxilla as well. I've seen your hand. The only one that probably you cannot really touch, but behind you can feel for it is the vulva, all right? Because it's contributing to the formation of the nasal septum. Yes, I saw. Uh, oh, yes. Remember, I talked, I even mentioned one suture, the internasal suture. Excellent. The nasal suture that is very, very prominent. The rest of them, yes, they'll form some sutures, but most of the times they are cartilaginous joints. Okay, we will talk about joints. Throw your hand, yes. Okay, so the anterior view, let's see if we'll be able to pick it. So the first thing that you must be able to picture is actually the, the nasal septum. Are you able to locate your nasal septum? Your nasal septum. Yes. So when you go, you try to go backwards, the nasal cavity, I mean the nasal septum is, is becoming bony. The, first, the anterior part is cartilaginous. Posteriorly is the bony nasal septum. And we are saying that this bony nasal septum, superiorly, we had it formed by the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone, inferiorly by the bone, all right? Let's see if I can pick it from the anterior aspect. <coughs> okay, so we've got our bone and then the green part there is the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid. Down there, I don't know whether it's pink. Yes, I was told it's pink. That's the vulva. This one, eh? Right? You are okay now? All right. So let's now talk about a bone that we do not consider as a facial bone, but is part of the bone that we find in the head region. This one is the mandible. And the bone of the lower jaw. The bone of the lower jaw. What's so prominent about the bone of the lower jaw? Yes, ma'am. It's the only movable uh, facial bone. Exactly. The only movable bone of the head region, right? Excellent. What else? is prominent about this particular bone. Yes, ma'am. 
I can't hear you, sweetheart. It's the strongest facial bone. Oh, okay. Hmm. Okay, I will reserve it. I will reserve that one. Okay, sweetheart. Yes. Yes? It is not paired. Yet it began as two pieces, right? Which other bone started as two pieces and ended up just being a, a single bone? The frontal bone. Thank you. Somebody read about like what I say. Right? Very good. There's something I'm looking for. What else is prominent about this bone? The bone of the lower jaw. Yes, ma'am. I want you to be a woman. Yesterday I told someone, I want you to be a man. A woman shouts when things go wrong. I want you to shout. <laughs> I know that things aren't wrong here. Can you hear? Okay. Yes, ma'am. It is not part of the scar. What is the scar? Scar. <laughs> oh, the scar. Okay. The scar is weird, okay? Yeah. If you just say scar, I'll think of the symbol that healed, right? Good, scow, huh? All right. It's not part of the scow. Yes, thank you so much. Anything else back then just talk to me? Before I go to Pista. Yes. Largest measure uh, What about the Mazula? Uh, the Mazula.
Give you love, joints. Is that clear? Okay, so the part that is forming the temporal mandibular joint is actually the head of the mandible. There's a condyle there, okay? Others will call it the condylar process, but there's also a head, okay? So that condylar process or the head that is there has a small neck, okay? And then anteriorly is the coronoid process. That is the coronoid process. It just serves as an attachment point for muscles. Clear? All right. So all the opening of the mouth, the protruding of your lower jaw, all those activities or movements occur at the temporal mandibular joint. When you start doing head and neck, there will be a lecture just on the temporal mandibular joint just on this particular joint. Okay. So when you look at, let me not give you too much information. Let's leave it there on the mandible. All right? So let's now look at another bone, which is not a bone of the skull. I'm simply trying to now move away from the skull. We are done with the skull. We looked at the cranial bones, we went on to look at the facial bones, and in addition, we looked at the mandible because it articulates with some of the cranial bones to make the temporal mandibular joint and to complete the, the, uh, the osteology of the head. Yes, sir. To modify sound. Sound comes from the larynx, okay? Which, we, which is uh, called the voice box by the layman, right? So when that sound is produced, it goes up into the nasopharynx, or I mean just the, the yes, the, the oropharynx and the nasopharynx, and that sound must be modified by a lot of things for us to be able to produce the sound that you are able to hear now, okay? For you to pronounce the word like three, what is needed there? You need your teeth, you need your tongue, you get it? You also need your, your pharynx as well as the nasal cavities as well as the paranasal sinuses for you to be able to amplify your, your, your voice. So there are lots of things that are needed. So you can remove all your teeth. You'll be able to talk still, but the pronunciation of words will be affected. Is that clear? Yes. I'm sure with a few of us who are lucky, have grandmothers who don't have teeth, the way they'll be pronouncing words will be different from the way we are going to pronounce words. Okay. So I'm now going to move away from the skull, still with the axial skeleton, which we say is the skeleton that we find in the center of the body, which included that structure that we looked at, the vertebral bones, the ribs, right, and the sternum. The next one that I'm going to talk about, I never mentioned it yesterday, but it's still part of the uh, axial skeleton. It's this bone here. I don't know whether you can see it. I'll do this. Can you see a little piece of bone there? Yes. So that bone is called the hyoid bone. Hyoid. We just sectioned it from the midline, and we are seeing the other part, okay? 
it says almost like a seashell and this bone apparently does not articulate with any other bone okay but it's a very important bone to which muscles of the neck are attached some muscles of the tongue are attached we are together and some muscles of the pharynx are also attached to this bone. It's called the hyoid bone. It's a C-shaped bone, okay? And it's found just in that area, somewhere here. Not articulating with any bone. Is that okay? Good. So this hyoid bone, I have a separate hyoid bone. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to have a separate hyoid bone. Nevertheless, <coughs> okay, so nevertheless, I'm saying that this bone has actually a body in the center. This part that I'm holding is the body of the hyoid bone. And when you have a close look at this same hyoid bone, it has this extension this side and this extension this side, which we are calling the greater horns. So there's a greater horn on the right, greater horn on the left. It's not a paired bone, it's a single bone, okay? It is C-shaped like that. So this part of our C-shape is the body. This extension of our C-shape is the greater horn. When you look at the body, the superior aspect of the body has a little extension, okay, on both sides, which we are calling the lesser horns. It has a body, the greater horns, and the lesser horns. And that it does not articulate with any bones. Is that clear? And where are we finding it? In the neck region. That is why we tried to show it here. Where is it again? Doesn't want to be seen. Is there such a thing? All right, so remember we've cut our C-shaped structure right in the midline, okay? So that we can see the body of the hyoid bone, the lesser horn, and the greater horn. Is that okay? I'm able to talk like this with my tongue because some of the muscles of the tongue are anchored to the hyoid bone. I'm able to swallow like that because some of the muscles of the pharynx are attached to the hyoid bone. Is that clear? I'm even able to do some of these things like because some of my neck muscles are attached to my hyoid bone. Oriented? Good. The next stop is the vertebral cord. Any person so far? Yes, madam. Be a woman. Talk. I am a woman. I'm talking. A small woman, yet her voice is very audible. Talk, talk, talk. Just me that question. Talk. Don't whisper. <coughs> Detached. 
Otherwise, you'll just be wasting time, right? Yes. yes. Come see that. You are protected. By the Lord. Yes, she's protected. No one can touch her. The answer was I come from behind. So my question was that what if uh, the anterior uh, the anterior nozzle septum was detached from the posterior nozzle septum? Can it still be reattached? Okay. Do you hear that? Okay, so she was asking if the Adam's apple, I will accept that question for now because I know she hasn't done red and neck because in my department I don't call it the Adam's apple, I call it the thyroid cartilage. Okay, so it's cartilage, okay. <coughs> The anterior part or the cartilaginous part of the of the nasal septum was to detach maybe as a result of somebody probably was involved in an RTA, road traffic accident, and then they sustain a fracture of the septum. And you discover that the bony septum has been detached from there from the cartilaginous septum, would the two reunite and heal? This is her question. I know, I, I won't, let me not waste my time asking the back benchers. <laughs> because they are still babies, okay? They are still feeding, Hi. Okay. So in that case, what usually happens is that Connective tissue comes into play. Connective tissue proper. So fibroblasts will rush to the site of the fracture and will immediately begin to lay down extracellular matrix in trying to attach the two pieces. That is how the two pieces are going to heal. Mind you, uh, bone is well vascularized, meaning it, is, it has a rich supply of blood vessels. Cartilage doesn't have a rich blood supply of cartilage, but because it's now riding on the bone, the good supply by bone, so that process will be accelerated. Okay, so fibroblasts will run to the side and touch up the two. Okay. Yes. They hit the nose. Now, be a, a little bit of a man. I want you to. <laughs> ah, you, you are thinking of a man in a different way. <laughs> 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 Don't think too much. You will sing. Sing as you never go to the end. Yes, sir. Okay. So, that question on what breaks. Depends on the force that you have you have uh, exerted, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I was saying. Yes, that's what I was saying. Depending on the amount of force that you exert, you exert on the nose. It's all that can just be the, the cartilage that will that will injure itself. Or that can extend through, even to the lateral walls. The maxilla can also fracture, okay? And also the vomer, as well as the ethmoid process can also break, depending on the force. Is that clear? So you can have fractures of the maxilla, okay? So you are going to learn about those when you get to 60 years, we are going to talk about the four fractures, but don't worry. So it depends on the amount of impact. Sorry. 
Because even people who are involved in road traffic accidents, they sustain fractures of the head and neck region. Among them are those same fractures. Okay? There was another hand. Are we going to move? Okay, yes. That's the last hand I'm taking. I just want to understand two things. The first one, I've seen so many bones ending in process. What is the process? The one what did we say a process was? Catalogation. <laughs> Were you there in our class yesterday and you missed it then? Yes. 
The next region is the region of the chest. Okay? And we are calling it the thoracic region. The next region. Okay? And we are calling it the lumbar region. And the next region there. Crawl region and the coccygeal region. So oh, the coccyx. Is that clear? And you realize that these regions are made up of the vertebral bones which are named after the region in which they are located. For instance, when you look at the cervical region, the cervical region has seven bones. It has seven vertebral bones. And we are calling each of the cervical vertebral bones as C1, beginning from, we are counting them. That is how we are going to name them. The superior most is C1. C meaning what? Cervical. So cervical one, C1. C2. C3 up to C7. Clear? Yes. In the thoracic region, there are 12 vertebrae. One is called a vertebra. Several are called vertebrae. <laughs> Clear? Backbenchers, you are, you are able to get me? Okay. And I'm saying that the thoracic vertebrae are also named as beginning from the topmost T1, T2, up to T12. And then the next vertebrae are the lumbar vertebrae. And these are five. What are you going to name them? L1 up to L5. Clear? The next ones are the sacro vertebrae. And they too are named as S1 up to S5. And you realize that as we go on, the vertebrae of the sacro region are fused in an adult like you and me, making that one big bone that we call the sacrum. This one is the sacrum. And there's one sacrum that is actually moving around. Yes. Okay? And then we have the coccyx. <laughs> or the coccygeal region. And these vertebrae can range from about two to four. Is that clear? Yes. And these ones are named as CO1, CO2, CO3, will those that even have the fourth one? CO4. We are okay? All right? Now, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. I wanted to keep that one for your head and neck region, but because you've already mentioned it, there are a few people who may have the eighth cervical vertebrae. Okay? Yes. We are together? Good. All right. So I was talking about the curvature of the, the vertebral column that we appreciate when we look at the lateral view of the vertebral column. And these curvatures, if you look at the one in the cervical region, we are seeing that the cervical region has a con convex curvature, right? The thoracic region has a concave. That's if we were to look at these curvatures. If I stand here, I'll be able to see that this bulging or this curve is actually bulging anteriorly, right? Mm -hmm. And if it's bulging anterior, then it's convex, right? Mm -hmm. Then when you look at the thoracic region, it is called curved anterior, right? Mm -hmm. The lumbar region? Convex. Convex. The sacro 
coccygeal region? It's concave. Concave, anteriorly. So where do these curvatures come from? And by the way, these curvatures can be divided into the primary curvatures and the secondary curvatures. What do we mean? So the primary curvatures are those curvatures we are born with. We are together. For instance, if you look at this little uh, theta sphere, can you see that there's already some curving of the spine? And how is it curved? It's curved in, uh, concave anteriorly. You need to specify, okay guys? You don't just say concave. Because it would matter if it matters where the curving is happening. So so if I say concave anteriorly, then I know that the curve is actually going that way. But if the same curve, if I come and view it here, it will be convex for six. The fetus naturally has that curvature, all right? But as this fetus, after it is born, at a certain stage, this fetus or this baby, oh, after it's born, it's no longer a fetus. It's a baby, right? Yes. <laughs> they develop the cervical heaven. Are you following me? At a certain stage, this baby also begins to learn to stand and support themselves, to sit and also to stand. And as they develop the lumbar, Vertebrae. Is that clear? Yes. And so those vertebrae, I mean those curvatures, did I say develop the lumbar vertebrae? They develop the lumbar curvatures and the lumbar curvatures are secondary curvatures. Sacrococcygeal curvatures are primary curvatures. And maybe for you to be able to appreciate it, the primary, remember the initial curvature was the concave anteriorly, right? So when you now look at this adult skeleton, which parts are concave anteriorly? Thus, the almost said thoracic. The thoracic and the sacrococcygeal curvatures are Concave anteriorly. Okay, because the ori original one was also concave what? anteriorly. And then the secondary ones are the ones that are convex anteriorly. Is that is that okay, mom? All right. Yeah, is that a handy or all right. An, an adaptation, right? When somebody wants to start supporting their head, you are you are trying to adapt to the weight, right? At the same time, when you are trying to sit and stand, you are also trying to find some balance. But you will see that in pregnant women, this curvature gets exaggerated. They, they end up having what we call low doses, right? They become so minamad <clears throat> here. Okay? So that doesn't mean that the lumbar curvature was not there. It is there, but just gets exaggerated due to the, the gravity and the force or the weight that they are carrying. Okay? Hey. All right, so let's just have an idea of the general structure of a vertebra. What, do we have whiteboard markers and, uh, and an eraser? Class reps, jump gun, I need you. <laughs> quickly, quickly, quickly! Ah. <laughs> 
the clever one here. Is he a classroom? No. Oh, well, this one I'll, 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 I'll appoint to classroom. Yes, thank you so much. And tissue ladies. Quickly, quickly, quickly. This one, no? <laughs> 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 this one has a point of view. Yes, what's your name? Huh? Poison? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And this guy, with you are his legacy. Poison, <laughs> 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 Okay. Thank you so much, Poison, Ivan. Oh, wait, 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 Were you related? No, no, no. What's wrong? You are in the house. Oh, good morning. Spirit. Don't feed it. Don't feed it. You are clever also. John P. John P. It's watch out. Our class reps. Ah, oh, yeah, my own class rep was a bang. The second. <laughs> which are in the anterior, posterior orientation. I will now lose that one when I use orientation. <laughs> okay. So if you've seen that lady there, she has scoliosis. The, this spine, instead of it curving in the anterior, posterior direction, it curves naturally. And that also has implications because the weight uh, of the body, the way it will be transmitted, will be affected this time, isn't it? And if you look at that other one there with kyphosis, they have an exaggerated thoracic, thoracic curvature. We saw that there was already a thoracic curvature, which is a primary curvature, right? Now, if it is exaggerated, that is what we refer to as kyphosis. And then we also have that person there. And in, in, in their place, I want to put a pregnant woman with an exaggerated uh, uh, lumbar curvature, what we call lordosis. Is that clear? Yeah. Thank you so much. So I'm now going to just give you a general structure of the vertebra. That's the general structure. So every vertebra will have a body. But before I draw this, I'm looking at just I'm just going to isolate one vertebra. Okay? And this one vertebra I want you to look at it from the superior view. Is that clear? Yes. Is that okay? Yes. I want you to look at it from the superior view. Okay, yes. That one then. So we are following this one, okay? We are looking at a vertebra from the superior aspect. We've isolated one, okay? And we are saying that if you look at that particular vertebra, the posterior aspect is the one on top. The anterior aspect is the one 
belong. Are you oriented? Look at that vertebra right up there in the corner. Are you seeing it? We are saying that we have isolated one vertebra and we are looking at it from the superior view. So much so that this part, which is pointing up, is actually the posterior aspect. This is the posterior aspect. Clear? Yes. Clear? Yes. You can see. This is the posterior aspect, right? Yes. And then the one, the part that is down is the anterior aspect. This is the anterior aspect. Clear? Yes. Good. So with that in mind, I'm now saying that anteriorly, every vertebra, uh, vertebra will have a vertebral body. Okay? Clear? Yes. This vertebral body is actually... Let me do it like this. So this is the anterior aspect, all right? Connected to the vertebral body posteriorly are pedicles. So this is a vertebral body. We are looking at the general structure of a vertebra. One is called a vertebra. Several are called vertebrae, okay? So anteriorly, you have the vertebral body. Connected to the vertebral body posteriorly are pedicles. How do you spell pedicles? Whichever way. Pedicles. Can you see my pedicles there? Hmm. I'm coming. So guys, you can see the pedicles? Right? Can you see our vertebral body now? You can't. I'm going to call them, there's one on the right, one on the left, which are meeting there. I'm going to call them the lamelle. One is a lamella. What, what do I say? Lamella, lamina. Okay, so I have the body. I have the pedicles. Standing from the pedicles, we've got the lamina. One is a lamina, several are lamina. I'll get back to you, okay? At the point where the pedicles and the laminae are meeting is an extension called the transverse process. So that's the transverse process, this one here, okay? At the point where the laminae are meeting is another process called the spinous process. Are you oriented? Yes. Now look at what is happening. The body, the two pedicles and the two laminae are leaving a space. And we are going to call that one as the vertebral foramen. Vertebral foramen. Is that clear? <coughs> if you know this structure, everything will be easy. I say that. We have a body, which is anteriorly mm -hmm. located, extending from it posteriorly are the pedicles. From the pedicles, we have the laminae, 
At the point where the pedicles and the laminae are meeting, we've got this extension, or this extension is called the transverse processes. And then at the point where the two laminae are meeting, we've got this extension called the spinous process. These guys now. Remember we talked about the body, right? You've seen the body, which is anteriorly directed, right? Mm -hmm. So extending from the body, we saw the two pedicles. Okay, from the pedicles, we saw the laminae. All right? At the point where the pedicle and the lamina are meeting, we've got this extension, which we're going to call the transverse process. This one and this one. Here, at the point where the two laminae are meeting, we've got this process there, which we are calling the spinous process. Who's behind? Who is behind? Where, sir? Come. Come. So this is how we are going to be locating these parts, okay? Okay, so come here. <coughs> Where is the body? Aha, uh -huh. extending from the body posteriorly, what do we call those things? These ones, the pedicles, okay? From the pedicles going medially, at the point where the pedicle and the lamina are meeting, <coughs> there is this extension. What did we call it? The transverse. Now we know it. That's a name. Okay. Having that idea, let's now look at this. Again, this is a superior view of the, of the vertebra. And we are saying that this yes. side is the anterior aspect yeah, but and so this can... side is the posterior aspect. Oriental? Mm -hmm. Oriental? Yes. yes. So we have our vertebral body and when you look at this guy here, when you look at this guy here, the bodies, the vertebral bodies are these ones you are seeing here. But they are anterior compared to the spinous processes. Is that what you are seeing? This is a body. That's a body. That's a body. That's a body. Is that clear? Yes. Extending from the bodies are these pedicles. Clear? From the pedicles, we've got the laminae. At the point where the pedicle and the lamina are meeting, we've got this extension we call it the transverse process. Clear? Yes. At the point where the two laminae are meeting, we call this extension called the spinous process. If I turn this guy like that, these structures you are seeing are the spinous processes of the individual vertebrae. Clear? Yes. So when you are asked to bend, these stick out, don't they? through your skin, right? Mm -hmm. So those things that you are able to feel and even count are the spinous processes. What you can't feel are the bodies because they are deep. Is that clear? Yes. <sighs> As you just said, you are able to now see and not the differences. I've given you the general structure. But there will be a little differences from the vertebra from one region to another. For example, if you look at the cervical vertebra, a typical cervical vertebra will have a bifid spinous process. Did you see what I did? We have a bifid. Bifid meaning it is splitting. Like the tongue of the snake. We've all seen the tongue of the snake, even on a picture, right? 
It splits like that, right? So it is bifid that we are saying that in the cervical region, a typical cervical vertebral will have a bifid spinous process. In addition, a typical cervical vertebra will also have in the transverse uh, processes some foramina, which we are calling the transverse foramina, or foram one is called the transverse foramen. So this is what we are talking about. This is a typical cervical vertebra with, and this is a superior view, by the way, okay? And you can see that the spinous process, what is happening there? It splits. It's splitting, it is bifid. Whenever you see a bifid spinous process, just know that that vertebra is from the cervical region. In addition, look at the transverse processes. Look at what is there. Can you see that there's a foramen? So yes. we are calling it the transverse foramen. There are two, one on the right, one on the left. Once you see those features, just know that you are looking at a cervical vertebra. Is that okay? Yes. In the thoracic region, a typical thoracic vertebra <coughs> should have areas or articular surfaces for the ribs. Do we find ribs in the cervical region? No. No. Do we find ribs in the lumbar region? No. Therefore, the vertebra of the thoracic region must have articular surfaces or facets for ribs. Therefore, when you look at the bodies, the bodies of the thoracic vertebra will have articular surfaces for the ribs. The transverse processes also, the articulating, if you look at these guys, the transverse processes are articulating also with the ribs. So the transverse process should have an articulating facet for the rib. The body should also have articulating process for the ribs. And the spinous processes are oriented posterior inferiorly. <coughs> That's it. That is the take home message and that I may be able to, I mean, I may ask you to reproduce it. Is that clear? Yes. No. No. Hey. <laughs> All right, so those were the thoracic vertebrae, the lumbar vertebrae. When you look at the spinous processes of the lumbar vertebrae, they are actually flattened laterally. What do I mean? like I'm, I'm applying pressure this side, at the same time also applying pressure this side. By the end of the day, how will my structure be? Smart. You push this side and you push that side. So it will be flattened laterally. Is that clear? Yes. And they are short and they are horizontally oriented. These ones, how are they oriented? Posterior. These ones horizontally oriented. Is that clear? Good. The sacrum or the sacrum vertebrae. So these ones in a baby, the individual vertebrae are independent from each other. They are attached to each other by cartilage. But once somebody grows, those joints ossify, meaning the individual vertebrae fuse to form one bone, which we are calling the sacrum. However, if you count the spinous processes, you have to find there about four spinous processes, okay? Because the last one usually you will not have, uh, it doesn't fuse completely. There's usually a gap just at that point. So in other words, we are simply saying that if you look at the bodies, the vertebral bodies, you'll be able to count five parts because five vertebrae 
fuse to form one. And then finally,